Father in heaven. Lord, we ask for your spirit to fill this place. Lord, we ask that you would help us to have the experience of Isaiah. To see that great vision of the Lord. That indeed as individuals, Lord, we would be purified and brought out of our Laodicean experience. Father, we pray for a coal from off the heavenly altar, a live coal. That that fire representing your spirit might fill us, Lord, and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Lord, we ask that you would grant us the eye sad the spiritual discernment of the word of God. We ask for the gold that's tried in the fire, that faith that works by love and purifies the soul. And we ask for that garment of our Savior's righteousness. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would cleanse us, that you would abide with us. And Father, in our ignorance, many times, Lord, we, we approach a high and holy God with our shoes on our feet. But Father, we ask that you would again forgive us for our ignorance as we remove them now. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your long suffering and your mercy towards your children. Bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We've been looking in the word of God for the past week at some beautiful things. Learn how to experience the early rain. We read a statement earlier during the week. We won't read it now. But that statement was very clear in giving us the understanding that if you and I don't experience the early rain, we'll never be a recipient of the latter rain. And it was surprising to me. It was surprising to me how many of our people had no, had never even heard that there was an early rain experience. And that's really, it shouldn't be shocking. It shouldn't really be shocking. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, since we were dealing with that in Sabbath school, notice Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1 describes the condition of the people of God at the end of the world. We're in Isaiah chapter 1. And we'll begin in verse 2. And when you're there, amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2. The Bible says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord hath spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, and my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more, the whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. God is describing the condition of Israel. And this wasn't just the condition that was local to their day. This is about us at the end of the world. Because Isaiah, the individual giving the message, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 6. The individual that was giving the message, he came to an understanding 
that his experience was the same as the very ones he was giving the message to. And I was hearing this morning, there was a brother who was ex explaining the condition of Isaiah and the vision that Isaiah had received. And he said very clearly that the vision given to Isaiah represents the condition of God's people in the last days. When Isaiah saw the vision, he recognized his own sinfulness. Isaiah had the condition of Laodicea. Isaiah thought he was better off than he really was. There's a lot of gain on the mic. Isaiah really understood when, once he saw Christ, his condition. And it wasn't until he was able to receive that spiritual vision that his life was touched. And what we've been doing together throughout the week is we've been going through how to advance daily in the Christian walk. And we've been reading this particular statement every single night from messages to young people. One, I'm going to read it again. It says, to make God's grace our own, we must act what? Our part. The Lord does not propose to perform for us either the willing or the doing. His grace is given to work in us to will and to do, but never as a substitute for our effort. Our souls are to be aroused to cooperate. The Holy Spirit works in us that we may work out our own salvation. We've been saying over and over again how the experience of the majority of Seventh-day Adventists is that God is to come and just do it all for us. And we sit and we wait for a change to take place, and it never comes. And then we get into a condition where we begin to blame God. And then we go into the opposite extreme, and we start saying, well, what the new theology teaches that we could never overcome, maybe that's the truth. But the experience that's in that quotation tells us that you and I have a part to play in our own salvation. And that is to how to cooperate with the Almighty. And so night after night, we've been going through God's part and our part. And we saw that he would draw us unto himself, and our part was to not resist his drawing. We saw that he would convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and our part was to acknowledge our guilt and need of his righteousness. We saw that he would give us repentance, and we saw that our part was to confess and forsake our sins and give him our heart. And then last night we saw how he would forgive, cleanse, regenerate, and free us to live the sanctified life. And we saw that our part was to believe and accept. And we looked in the book of 1 John, and I invite you to turn back there with me into 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Because you see, Isaiah was given a gift, and it was a beautiful gift. And it was a gift that for, for the life of me, I don't understand why we as Seventh-day Adventists don't want to receive it. But the gift that was given to Isaiah is a gift that Jesus Christ desires to give unto all his children. But the Bible tells us the sad thing is that the majority will not receive it. The majority will not receive the gift that Isaiah was able to receive. The gift that Paul was able to receive and Ezekiel and all the prophets. We won't receive that gift. You see, Isaiah came under conviction that he was not where he thought he was. And once he realized by seeing Jesus how faulty he was, he was able to then be purified with that live coal. And as a church, as a church, we pray for the live coal. We pray for the Holy Spirit. We pray to be filled with God, but never having seen our own sinfulness. And the majority of God's people won't receive that precious gift from the heaven's altar because they don't understand themselves. But we saw last night in 1 John chapter 1, in verse 9, and when you're there, amen. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we've been looking in practical ways 
how we are to experience the early rain. How we are to experience the early rain. And last night we saw how God's promise was that he would forgive and cleanse and regenerate. And it says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, when you're there, amen. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And by way of review, we saw that the gift of God is not just forgiveness. It's not just, justification is not just a judicial act of pardon. Justification brings man to a condition where in the eyes of God, he's never sinned. It's a reclaiming from sin. Justification is not just forgiveness, but it brings a total change. And not just a change whereby the old life is made better. Justification is a new life altogether. Amen. And we saw that once that experience comes, the promise of Ezekiel, chapter 36, can be ours. Notice Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. As we do every night or every discourse, we want to make sure by way of review that we understand before we move forward into the next step. And we saw that in 1 John chapter 1, that Christ's forgiveness not only pardons, but reclaims us from sin. In Ezekiel chapter 36, the new covenant promise is given. We're in Ezekiel. Chapter 36 and verse 25. Notice what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 25. And when you're there, amen. The Bible says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A what? New heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. The Bible shows, very clear, the Bible shows, That once an individual has this experience, God grants them the blessings of his spirit. And the blessings of his spirit gives him the ability to be obedient to the commandments of God. Without the spirit of God, obedience is impossible. Obedience is impossible unless we have received of his spirit. And we saw in the book of Mark. Turn to the book of Mark. We saw in the book of Mark. That the blessings of God are there for our asking when we come with a sincere heart. And in Mark chapter 9, there's a story we want to go through in Mark chapter 9, beginning with verse 14. And this story illustrates how you and I can come to Jesus Christ for these blessings. And in Mark chapter 9, verse 14, again, amen when you're there. The Bible says in verse 14, and when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question you with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And whatsoever or wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples and they, that they should cast him out, and they could not. And he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And they brought him unto Jesus, 
And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since he came unto him? And he said, of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But, and this is how we approach God, but if thou canst do anything, here we are in the presence of God, saying, Lord, if you can do anything, not recognizing his power, but if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. And in Desire of Ages we're told that if we come to Christ and we fall at his feet and we say to him, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief, in that condition we can never be lost, never. That's a promise. You see, some of us have somewhat of a belief in the word of God, somewhat of a faith. But when it comes to saying you can gain victory over all sin, that's where we begin to waver. And so when Christ says, come to me, when Christ says you can have victory, we come and we should say, Lord, I believe a little bit, but help thou my unbelief. And in sincerity, when we pray that prayer, we can never be lost. Never. And that's not my words, that's the word of God. That's the word of the prophet. In the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14, one of the beautiful promises in the word of God in regards to prayer, and we really haven't touched on the power of prayer. But the power of prayer, that's part of the armor of the Christian that many of us don't really utilize like we should. And it says in 1 John chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. And when you're there, amen. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the what? Confidence. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, what? He heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So when we come to God in prayer and we ask anything, according to his will, it's done. And we can have confidence, we can get up off of our knees knowing that it's done. But what's the will of God? That's the key. What is the will of God? Notice what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians what chapter? Chapter 4. The Bible says we can have confidence that when we pray in the will of God, anything and everything we ask will be done. But we need to understand what the will of God is. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll begin at verse 3. And when you're there, amen. The Bible says, for this is what? The will of God, even your what? Sanctification. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Jump down to verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto what? Holiness. God's will is that we be sanctified. God's will is that we be holy. So when we come to God asking him to give us victory over sin, he can give it. It's done. But it's based upon our belief. You see, many of us approach God and we say the prayer, 
but we leave the promise. We say the prayer, get up off our knees, and the promise remains right where we knelt because our belief is not strong. We pray because that's what we've been taught as a child to do, but there's no power. God tells us today, and he's been telling us all throughout the week, that if we come in sincerity, if we desire to be changed, if we want to be new, it will be done. That's why Christ died for us on Calvary. The experience of being converted and having repentance is the early rain experience. If we don't have that experience, we will never be a recipient of the latter rain. And so we've begun the week looking at this early rain experience, desiring to really have an experience with Jesus Christ because starting Monday night, we're going to start jumping into some very deep things. And we need to have this foundation laid because, brethren, we can see all the beauties in the Word of God. But if we don't see Christ, it accomplishes nothing. I want to read a statement to you. And this is taken from Manuscript Release 41, 1897. It says, those who, dishonor God by transgressing, those who dishonor God by transgressing his law may talk sanctification, but it is that of that value and just as acceptable as was the offering of Cain. Obedience to all the commandments of God is the only true sign of sanctification. Disobedience is the sign of disloyalty and apostasy. And so when we sin, when we sin, we're breaking the commandments of God. Therefore, we're not obedient. In the eyes of God, apostasy is written next to our name. That's how serious life is right now. On the books, apostasy is written next to every one of our name. That is, unless we've fallen at the feet of Jesus and accepted the gift of his blood. And that's what we looked at last night because the Bible says in 1 John, flip back with me to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. We saw in verse 9 that if we would confess our sins, that he was faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But verse 7 tells us the medium whereby we're cleansed. The Bible says in verse 7, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, when you're there, amen. The Bible says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the what? Blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So what we need to have applied to our account is the blood of Jesus. Amen. The blood of Jesus is what you and I need today. Now, before we go through our discourse this morning, I invite you again to close your eyes with me as we have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, again, we pray for the guidance of your spirit. And we ask, Lord, that you would be very close to us this morning. We pray, Lord, that it would, there would be unmistakable evidence that the spirit of God is in this room. While Satan does all he can to cast it away from individual hearts, I pray that the power of angels that excel in strength would bind him, that you would cast forth any distraction, that you would remove from us the demon of sleep, and that you would allow us to see our Savior as Isaiah saw him. And Father, I pray that as we begin to look in the prophetic word beginning Monday night, I pray, dear Lord, that that coal, that live coal, would be applied to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says in 1 John, excuse me, John chapter 1. Our scripture reading this morning was John chapter 1, beginning with verse 11. And this morning we're talking about how God will empower us how he will empower us, how he will live in us, and we are to live by his power and bear much fruit. This is the experience we're talking about 
this morning. We're in first we're in John, excuse me, chapter 1 and verse 11. And when you're there, amen. Before we read, everybody should have had received a handout. Has everyone received the handout? Amen. There's a handout that says experiencing the early rain. It's lesson five. There's quotations we will be reading together. It should look like this. How many do not have this handout? All right. Do we have any left over? Are there any leftover handouts? Or maybe a family can share one and give one of theirs to those who have not. But we're in John chapter one. And verse 11, and the Bible says, amen, the Bible says he came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he what? Power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Those who be receive power to become the sons of God are born of God. They're born again. And the Bible shows that that power comes from Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You see, this birth that we've received, the birth that was of blood and of the will of man, it means nothing to God. It means nothing to God at all. The birth that we should have should be from above. And God gives us power to become his sons, even to them that believe on his name. Now, in your handouts, there's two statements. The first two statements on the page, under God's part. We're reading Christ's Object Lessons, page 314. For those who do not have a handout, you can take notes. Christ's Object Lessons 314, it says, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. This power is not in the human agent. It is the power of God when the soul receives Christ. He receives power to live the life of what? Christ. Not power to live the life in Christ. It's the power to live the life of Christ. You see, we belittle the gospel by saying that we cannot mimic his steps. We belittle the gospel by saying that we can't be like he was. That's the whole reason he came. The Bible says that we receive power to become the sons of God. We receive power to live the life of Christ. Notice the next statement, that I may know him. 100. When the sinner accepts Christ and lives in him, Jesus takes his sins and weaknesses and then grafts the repentant soul into himself so that he sustains the relation to Christ that the branch does to the vine. We have nothing, we are nothing, unless we receive virtue from Jesus Christ. Amen? You and I are nothing. We have nothing unless we receive virtue from Jesus. Isaiah understood that when he saw him. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. Paul had the same experience. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And that's the experience that God desires for us to have this morning. But it says that when we receive Christ, that Christ grafts us into himself. In other words, he molds us onto himself and we receive his life-sustaining power. The book of John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and we're talking about how Jesus will empower us and live in us. John chapter 15, beginning with verse 4. John what chapter? 15 and beginning with verse 4. The Bible says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, 
No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, what? Ye can't do nothing. Without Christ, nothing can be done. Amen? Simple. Outside of Christ is not life. In Christ is life. And that abundantly. Separated from Christ, there's no power. In Christ, we can do all things. Amen. It says very clear in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 beginning with verse 2. And brethren, we're just looking at the beautiful realities of the gospel. The simple realities, the fundamentals of the gospel. You see, what we've been going through this week is entry-level Christianity. Entry-level. If we haven't experienced it, we've never begun the Christian walk. Entry level Christianity, 2 Peter chapter 1. Notice verse 2. Because God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Notice what the Bible says, verse 2, and when you're there, amen. amen. The Bible says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and through and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us what? Exceeding great and precious promises. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What is the divine nature? What's the divine nature? Selflessness. Think of Christ. What nature did Christ have? We saw last night he had the human nature. But humanity clothed what? Divinity. God was within. The divine nature is not just that given to Christ alone. It's given to all those who believe the promises of God. Christ can be formed within man. Now that might seem strange, and I'm seeing some faces that say, wait a minute, how can we have the divine nature? Brethren, that's not my word, that's the word of God. Christ can be formed within us, within man. And notice what it says in verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be what? In you, and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren, nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. With these things within us, the Bible says, our mind would be pregnant with the understanding of God. It gives birth over and over again to beautiful and wonderful truths. But without it, our mind is barren. And that's why the majority of us have problems taking a thoughtful hour each day thinking of Jesus. Because he's not here anyway. But it says going forward in verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is what? Blind. He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot what? See afar off. In other words, if we don't have the experience, we'd be blind and we couldn't see that which is to come. Prophecy will make no sense to us because we'd be blind if we don't go through the steps of Peter's ladder. And that's what it's called in the spirit of prophecy, Peter's ladder. If we don't go through each round of the ladder, adding unto faith virtue and to virtue knowledge 
and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and so on and so forth, if we don't have that experience, if these things are not in us and abound, we're blind, and we cannot see afar off. And it goes on even further. It says, and we have forgotten that we were purged from our old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, what? Ye shall never fall. God is able to keep us from falling. But if that experience isn't there, we have the roller coaster religion up and down in the Christian life, sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting. Claiming Christianity. Entry level Christianity brethren is what we're talking about. And it might seem like a new concept. It might seem like wait this is too good to be true or it can never transpire with me. But if these things are not in us we remain blind. And what was the problem? One of the problems with Laodicea. They were blind. We will never come out of our Laodicean experience if we don't have this experience. It goes on to say even further. For so an entrance. Shall be ministered unto you abundantly. In the everlasting kingdom. Of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. When we have this experience brethren. With Paul we can have the assurance of salvation. With Paul we can say that. I have the expectancy of being saved. We can go on our deathbed and by the grace of God you and I will be alive to see Jesus come. And not be one that tries to hide in the caves and in the rocks. Not those individuals that see him come. But the ones who will see him come. The ones who will hear the day and the hour of his coming. The ones that will be 144,000 in number. By God's grace we'll have that experience. We'll have the experience of knowing by faith that we will be saved. Do you have that experience this morning? Can you literally go to God and in confidence say, I will be saved? If we don't have that experience, which the Bible is replete with individuals who came to that experience, if we don't have that experience, we've been walking too close to the edge. We just haven't fallen off yet. We've been just, 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 just close enough to God and close enough to the world. You know, Sister White had a vision. She had a vision of the two crowns. Have you ever heard that vision? She had a vision of two crowns. One was the earthly crown, the other was the heavenly crown, and she described God's people as trying to hold on to both. One hand on the earthly crown while stretching to reach the heavenly. They had an experience that just in case I don't reach that one, at least I'll have this one. But that's the experience of us as Seventh-day Adventists this morning. God is trying to get us to release everything that's earthly and press towards the mark. That's fundamental Christianity. It says in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16 the Bible says that he would give us power the Bible says that in 2 Peter chapter 1 that he's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness even that which would give us the divine nature that's God's promise Ephesians says it this way chapter 3 and verse 16 again when you're there amen the Bible says that he would grant, it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be what? Strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend. Now let's pause there. The reason why some of us. And I'm not saying all, because what we're going to be going through for this month, I can guarantee is new to many. But some of us who have just begun to pierce 
through the, the unseen realities of God and his prophetic word. Some of us have been going over this for so long and yet we cannot comprehend it. Yet it's difficult to grasp. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, verse 17, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend. If there's no comprehension and the deep things of God's word. It's because Christ is not dwelling within. Are we getting the picture? We need to make sure that Jesus Christ is in us. It says in verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints. What is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the what? Fullness of God. The promise that Jesus received, the Bible says that in him was all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That same gift is promised to you for those who would receive it. The Bible says that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that what? Worketh in us. Again, we're talking about how Jesus Christ will empower us. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. It says, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Christ desires to give us power. Christ's Object Lessons 384. 384. This is about the sixth quotation down. It says, gospel religion is Christ in the life a living active principle you see gospel religion is not how good we can sing gospel religion is not how good we can pray or how good we can preach or how good we can look on Sabbath that's not gospel religion gospel religion is a principle a living active principle within it's not something that can be attained by works. It's only attained through faith. It says gospel religion is Christ in the life. A living active principle. It is the grace of Christ revealed in character. And wrought out in good works. An active principle. Galatians chapter 2. Paul understood the principle of Christ being formed within. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And what I want you to understand is Galatians 2 and 20, a verse that we can all quote. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 is what, really, what it really means to be born again. This is the true born again experience. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, when you're there, amen. The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's new birth experience. How did Paul come to this experience? How did Paul, or how was Paul able to say I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet it's not I. It's not self. But Christ that liveth in me. How was he able to come to that experience? The Bible says in 1 John. 1 John. We can say it's by faith. But faith cometh by the word of God. And the Bible says in 1 John. Chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, it's a chapter we've looked at quite a number of times during the week, but we're going to go through it again. Because in my own experience, 
This is one of the most powerful chapters in the word of God. Powerful chapters. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. When you're there, amen. It says, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And ministers all over the world quote the first two verses. And they'll say, see, now we're the sons of God. Now we're the children of God, and everybody feels good. But John is being serious and explains the son of God, daughter of God experience. He goes forward in verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Whosoever, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested, Christ was manifested to take away our sin. And in him is no sin. How many claim to be in Christ? Yet sin. The Bible says in him is no sin. It goes on to say, whosoever abideth what? In him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the what? The devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning, and for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, whosoever is born again, whosoever has received him and has been given power to become the sons of God, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he what? Underline it. Underline that word. For his seed remaineth in him, and he what? Cannot sin, because he is born of God. He cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. The Bible shows two classes of men wrought out by the gospel. Those who are the sons of God and those who belong to Satan. Those who are born again and those who have never been born, only existing. Those who have given, been given literal eternal life and those who have no understanding what life is. Has no understanding what it means to live and that abundantly. Two classes of men. And what separates the two? is whether or not the seed remains in you or not. Now what is the seed? The Bible says in Peter, 1 Peter. Notice 1 Peter. The Bible explains all things for us, so we don't have to do any guesswork. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, John says the seed of God remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23 tells us what the seed is. When you're there, amen. amen. The Bible says being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of what? Incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The seed is the word of God. And it doesn't mean... When we say that the seed remains in us, it doesn't mean that we memorize and we just memorize scripture and the seed remains in. That's not how the seed remains in us. Because the word of God is Jesus himself. 
Amen? First John, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 tells us that Jesus is the Word. So when Jesus is in us, we cannot sin. But again, how does that transpire? How does Jesus Christ enter in and remain in the life? Testimonies to Ministers 389 on the first page of your handouts. Second quotation from the bottom. It says, when his words of instruction have been received and have taken possession of us, Jesus is to us an abiding presence, controlling our thoughts, our ideas, and actions. It is no more we that live, but Christ that lives in us, and he is the hope of glory. Self is what? Dead. When the word of God stays within and how does the word of God remain in? It's very practical. It's so practical, we miss it. How does God's word stay within man? The Bible says we are not to be hearers of the word only, but doers of the word, because the doer of the word is he who is justified. If the word of God is to remain in when we start studying, when we have our private devotion, and we're going through the word of God, and God shows us a principle that must be implemented in the life, what do we do? We do it. And by doing it, the seed remains in. And as God begins to show us more truth, what do we do? We do it, and the seed remains in. The problem with us is we love to hear the word of God. We receive the word of God with all readiness of mind. But we don't go home and search the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. We don't go home and see how we can practically implement this in the life. And that's why we go up and down in our experience. If the word of God told us that every morning we need to do three jumping jacks, what should we do? Three jumping jacks. That doesn't mean do two. It doesn't mean say one morning, Lord, it's cold. I'm going to stay in the bed. It doesn't mean that we only do two and a half. We do three. Amen? What God says to do, we do. And we don't have the power. We've seen it over and over and over again. We don't have the power to obey. So who gives us the power? But the will is what actuates God's power. When we say, Lord, I see it. I will to do it. I positively choose to act upon what you show me. Then God's power gives you the motive. God's power gives you the ability to do what he said. It's not just reading the word of God. It's not just knowing the scriptures. It's not knowing how to quote the three angels of Revelation 14. It's not just fear God and give glory to him thinking that that's the experience or that's really what... No. It's an active principle in the life. The three angels' message, brethren, the three angels' message we're going to see has so many different layers of truth. But the beauty of it, the beauty of it, is that's the experience of the people of God and the experience of the people of God that we must have if we are going to be the ones to give the message to the world. We can never have the experience if we never knew the man. It goes on to say, When Christ's words of instructions have been received and have taken possession of us, Jesus is to us an abiding, in, it's an abiding presence, controlling our thoughts and ideas and actions. It is no more we that live, but Christ that lives in us. And he is the hope of glory. Self is dead, but Christ is a living Savior. That's what Paul meant when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He obeyed from the heart the word that was given unto him. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. Now, I don't know what time we started, so you may, may have to make sure that I end on time. But Hebrews, chapter 13, how much time do we have? All right, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. And when you're there, amen. 
The Bible says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you what? Perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. The Bible says God gives us power and works in us, and that power makes us perfect to do all his work, to do all his will. We don't have to fall short as the people of God. And the reason why Seventh-day Adventism is a mockery to the rest of the Christian world is because they don't see power. They don't see power in the church because we don't live the message. We don't live it. That's why we're told that if God would bring people into the church, just flood people into the message, what state would we leave them in? If they came to the church today, what type of Christians would they end up being? All we have to do to answer that question is look in the mirror. That's the Christianity they'd have. They wouldn't have Jesus. They'd have you and I. And brethren, you and I aren't going to take anybody anywhere. Only Jesus Christ and his power. But the Bible is so clear as to say that Christ would give us that power. And in the book of John chapter 15, let's turn back there. God's part was that he would give us power to live the sanctified life. God's power is what actuates us. It gives us the ability to keep the commandments. True obedience from the heart is sanctification. And that's God's will for us. And that can only be received by power from on high. But 1 John chapter 15 and verse 6 tells us our corresponding obligation. Verse 6, and when you're there, amen. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my what? Words abide in you. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be what? Done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. The disciples of Christ are those who bear fruit. Those who bear fruit are Christ's disciples. And what fruit are we to bear? The fruits of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what you and I are to bear. And we'll go there in just a moment. But I want to read one more statement. And this is Selected Messages, Volume 1, 337. This is on page two, second quotation under our part. It says, Christ abiding in the soul exerts a transforming power. And the outward aspect bears witness to the peace and joy that reign within. We drink in the love of Christ. And as the branch draws nourishment from the vine, as the branch draws nourishment from the vine, if we are grafted in Christ, if, fiber by fiber, we have been united with the living vine, we shall give evidence of the fact by bearing rich clusters of living fruit. The way that you can ascertain whether or not you're connected with Jesus is whether or not you have the fruit of the Spirit. Not one fruit. Not just a little bit of kindness there. A little bit of patience here. A little bit of love over here. No. All the fruit of the Spirit. Because when God gives us the fruit of the Spirit, it doesn't just develop one after the other. He gives it to us at the same time. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Galatians. Notice the book of Galatians. Chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And verse 19. Galatians what chapter? Five. Chapter 5 and verse 19. 
The Bible says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Now we're going to go through a list of things. That's the works of man and the work of the Spirit. And if we have all of the works of the Spirit, then we're Christ's disciple. If we have any of the works of the flesh, we're not Christ's disciple. This is how Christ gauges our experience. And he does this for us. He does this for us. He wants us to see in reality our own experience. He wants us to examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith. And notice what he does. Notice how he, he rattles off in verse 19 and onward. Now the works of the flesh are, that are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you, to tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who do such things are lost, Paul says. And then he shows those who will inherit the kingdom. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have what? Crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Those who are Christ's have died to self. Those who are Christ can say with Paul that I'm crucified with him. Those that are Christ. Now desire of ages. We're going to read through a few quotations. A few quotations. Desire of ages. 676. Desire of Ages 676, and when you're there, this is on page two of your notes, let me hear you say amen. It says, when, this is the third quotation under our part. When we live by faith on the Son of God. Now, the reason why we're going through these particular quotations, by the way, is because when we think of sin, and this is something we've talked about during the week as well. When we think of sin, we most, most often think of the grosser sin. We think of the baser sins, the things that we really wouldn't like anybody to know that we do. But we don't really mind, we, we really don't mind if they see us get a little impatient. We don't mind if they see us go off a little bit. We don't mind if our children get scolded. We don't mind those things. We don't mind if there's, there's such a problem between spouses that we really can't sleep together in the same room. We don't mind that. We don't mind those things. We say, well, that's just human nature. But notice what it says, Desire of Ages 6, 7, 6. It says, when we live by faith on the Son of God, the fruits of the Spirit will be seen in our life. Not one will be what? Missing. The life of Christ in you produces the same fruit as in him. Now, how do we know really our experience? Not by the baser sins, it's by the heart sins. If we have the heart sins, then we're in a very bad position. Now notice statement after statement. Review and Herald, December 21st, 1886. Are you in a position where you do not possess these graces? Just as soon as anyone crosses you or, or offends you, does there arise in a heart a feeling of bitterness? A spirit of rebellion. If this is the spirit you have, bear in mind that you have not the spirit of Christ. It is what? Another spirit. And there's only two. There's only two. Either it's God or it's the devil. Don't play. Let's be real. It's either Christ or it's Satan. 
Notice the next statement. The Spirit of Christ will be revealed in all who are born of God. Strife and contention cannot arise among those who are controlled by His Spirit. There won't be arguings if we're controlled by the Spirit of God. That won't transpire if Christ is within. And now, brethren, listen, don't think about somebody else. This is about us tonight, this morning. Amen. It says very clearly, if Christ will be revealed, it says the Spirit of Christ will be revealed in all who are born of God. Strife and contention cannot arise among those who are controlled by His Spirit. It says, by their fruits ye shall know them. Next statement. Either God or Satan controls the mind. And the life shows so clearly that none need mistake of which power you yield allegiance. That means you can't even hide it. You can't hide it. And that's why so many non-Christians, so many non-Christians, they look at the church. They look at individuals within the church and they want to see Jesus within you. They want to make sure whether the truths you teach really have power. I remember my, uh, my best friend, my best friend's wife, she used to be an atheist. She used to not have, she used to not believe in God, and you know why? Because she met a whole lot of Christians that taught her a whole lot about Jesus, but never once did she see it in their life. All the things they told her, she said, well, that must not be any power there, because not one of them exhibit that experience. And so there must not be a God. There really must not be a God. Now we can say all we want. Well, people should not come into the church looking at us. They should look to Jesus. True. We should look to Jesus. But you see the 144,000, they don't just give the message. They live the message. And people will see Christ in them. That's what will draw the abundance of the sea unto God's people. So says Isaiah. It goes on to say, when we give way to impatience, when we give way to impatience, we drive the Spirit of God out of the heart and give place to the attributes of who? Satan. Just a little impatience goes a long way. When we become impatient for any reason, Satan comes in. Christ, brethren, was able to live on earth and go through th things that you and I have no clue and will really never experience to that magnitude. And he went through them without getting impatient, even in thought. He didn't bat an eye at an individual. He didn't cut a look at an individual, not by word, not by look, not by action was any root of bitterness within himself. And Jesus overcame in the same way that you and I must overcome. We might have gotten all the outside nice and clean. The sepulchers might be nice and whited. But inside, there'll be dead men's bones. It's time to stop being a Pharisee. Amen. In closing, the Bible says in James chapter 3, James chapter 3, beginning with verse 14, James chapter 3 and verse 14. God wants us to look at the practical because it's often that the practical is what's missing in our life. James chapter 3, beginning with verse 14, and when you're there, amen. It says, but if ye have bitter envies and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion 
and every evil work. And who is the author of confusion? The devil. It says where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure and then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that what? Maketh peace. Are you a peacemaker this morning? Are you a peacemaker? Or are we the ones that stir up the strife? Brethren, God is calling us to a much higher, higher experience than that which we now have. Two more quotations before we pray. This is page three of your handouts, Review and Herald. Fourth quotation from the bottom, July 12, 1887. Paul, in the book of 2 Corinthians, told us that we are to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. How are we to examine ourselves? Is it because maybe we follow the health message that we're in the faith? Or maybe it's because we, we follow the dress reform. Maybe it's that way. Or maybe it's because we homeschool our children. Or maybe, maybe it's because we're living in the country where we should all be living. Maybe that's how we know we're Christians. Now notice what she says. This is the acid test. This is how we can see whether we be in the faith. But you will say, how am I to know that Christ is in my heart? If when you are criticized or corrected in your way, and things do not go just as you think they ought to go. If then you let your passions arise instead of bearing the correction and being patient and kind, Christ is not abiding in the heart. That's how we know. We can have all the truth. We can have all the understanding and not have an ounce of experience. We can be able to delineate the word of God. We can be able to turn scripture to scripture. But if we become impatient, if we have fault finding, if we have problems with our brethren, we're not sound in the faith. We're not rooted and grounded in love. Last quotation. Page four. Third quotation from the top. It says, SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 3, 1160. It says, the greatest insult that we can inflict upon Christ is to pretend to be his disciples while manifesting the spirit of Satan in our words, our disposition, and our actions. Brethren, we have a lot of growing to do. And every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Jesus Christ has said with no uncertain terms that when he comes, would he find faith on the earth? He says that he's looking for a people of faith. And a people of faith is a lot more than we really think it is. Christ is looking for individuals who have his experience. He's looking for the individuals that when he ascended to heaven, he made sure that they would have a place with him before he accepted the glory and the crown back. He's looking for the individuals that he asked the Father, Father, I wish that those who thou hast given me be with me where I am. He's looking for those individuals, but those individuals are not the ones fighting between themselves. Not the ones who are going off on husbands and wife and children. Not the ones who have these evil thoughts. Not the ones who have the wicked ways. Those are not the ones Christ is coming for. He's coming for a people that reflect his character to the utmost. 
The early rain experience is an experience that's greatly lacking in our life. And Peter has told us very clear that we are to repent and be converted. That our sins would be blotted out when the times of refreshing would come from the presence of the Lord. And brethren, as I've said before, so say I now again, the refreshing is fallen. It's falling. Are we repentant and converted? Today God has talked to your heart. He's spoken to your heart in that still small voice and he says what was being said today was about you. And he's offering an opportunity to come to him and again be cleansed by that precious blood. Will you be cleansed this morning? Will you say, Jesus, I believe, but help thou my unbelief? If that's your desire, I invite you just to kneel with me as we pray. Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. Father in heaven, Lord, you've spoken to every heart. And Lord, we realize that we are the people of unclean lips. We realize, dear Lord, that we are the epitome of a Laodicean this morning. Rich and increased with goods and having need of nothing. But not knowing that we are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Father, we desire to be made whole. We desire to be cleansed, changed, made new. We desire that for us the death of Christ would not have been in vain. And we apologize, Lord, in the only way we can for trampling upon the precious blood of your Son and counting the blood of the covenant an unholy thing. But, Father, in your long suffering and your mercy, while the door is still open for us, we ask, dear Lord, that you would do the work in our life that you've tried to do for so many years. Lord, we are privileged to be Seventh-day Adventists. We are privileged to have the last message of mercy to not only be given to the world, but to be experienced by us first. Lord, that privilege is overlooked. But Lord, we ask that you'd help us, dear Father, to not just understand the importance of our message, but to have the experience that the message is calculated to bring to those that yield the stubborn heart. This morning, Father, we yield asking for the cleansing of Calvary. Thank you, Father, that we have the confidence that if we ask anything according to your will, that you would hear us. Father, give us the faith to remember and to understand and to know that even now we can be whole in Christ Jesus. That from this point forward, if the heart is sincere, justification has been wrought, pardon has been given, reclaiming from sin, and you now have given us the power to walk before you and to be perfect. Lord, help us to believe it and to live in like manner. In Jesus' name we pray.